Hello, this is Philip Cargom. Welcome to Tea with the Druid 158. I'm recording this uh, just after the summer solstice. No, just after the winter solstice. And uh, so it's pre-recorded and I've got a treat for you today. Today, it's a completely different format. What Tea with the Druid is going to be is the interview I had with the author John Matthews. Uh, a couple of weeks ago and recorded, uh, some of which has appeared on Druidcast, uh, the podcast of the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids, which who brings you this Tea with the Druid. Um, and um, welcome, by the way, if you're watching this as, as the recording and um, welcome to everyone. Now this, okay, so normally you, the, the show is about 20 minutes long. I talk for about 10 minutes and then there's a meditation for 10 minutes, but we're going to do something different. We're going to have this um, interview that I uh, had with John Matthews, the film of it. If you've heard the interview on Druidcast, then buzz forward about 50 minutes and you'll find that the interview carries on and I start to talk about tarot decks and I start to show the various tarot images from the beautiful decks that John has been involved with. So do enjoy this interview and uh, next week Roma Johnson who you might have seen the lovely home blessing she gave us all uh, a few weeks back she's going to be uh, on Tea with the Druid and then the week after that I'll, I'll be live. Okay, so I hope you had a lovely Christmas and many, many blessings. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be talking today to John Matthews, known to many of you, if not all of you, I'm sure, and uh, known to me uh, for about 30 years. We, we met John, didn't we, about 30 years ago? Uh, about that, at least. Yes, it must yeah. be. Yeah. Thank you for finally agreeing to talk. Thirty years of of, of, of persuasion, um, but in fact, we've been meaning to do this for years, haven't we? And, yeah, and that is true. And, yes. Yeah. And it's the usual thing with friends: is you always say you'll do something, and then it takes you years to get around to doing it. I know, and every time I bump into you, which is quite frequently, um, you know, we always say, you know, we really must do, and then <laughs> it never happens. But I'm very happy it is now, anyway. Fantastic, fantastic. So what I, I think a good place for us to start really is, is for me to just say to you or ask you, what got you started on all this? Wow, well, I mean, that's both an easy and a difficult question to answer because um, I guess I always had a natural psychic energy. Um, it was something I used to see things all the time when I was little. And my mother would spend half the time telling me not to imagine I had too much imagination or of course there's nothing there to be afraid of or you know when I would say what is that little man over there and what's he doing and she couldn't see it um, of course I had no idea what that meant at the time and uh, where, where was this Get, what, what's this the is, setting in uh, the outskirts of London where I was born in in Southgate right uh, which is right. North London yeah, um, and um, I have, uh, you know, been in. I was in and around London well until about thirty years ago when I moved down here to Oxford. Great. Uh, so you're in Southgate, and your mum's telling you this. What's your dad saying? He wasn't saying much because he wasn't around very much. Um, right. They were they were not together. Right. Uh, most of my life, in fact, I used to see that see him once a week because he was a dentist. He had a dental surgery practice in Harley Street and uh, we would go up my mother was his nurse and oh, so gosh. they would be busy in the surgery and I'd usually hang around outside and um, watch the, the clients coming in and out and oh, gosh so you sort of hung out in a dentist's waiting room once a week it wasn't even the waiting room actually it was on the stairs it was oh, a big man. grand house as all those houses are in Harley Street and there were all kinds of celebrities upstairs so people yeah. would come past me and say hello and I'd be reading as usual yeah. um, and it wasn't in fact until oh gosh I'd been doing that for a couple of years I suppose and this very pleasant and elegant gentleman used to come past me almost every time ask me what I was reading and so forth and then suddenly out of the blue my dad got two tickets to a concert and it turned out that the gentleman in question was um, Sir William Walton uh -huh. Rosa, who and we went along to hear what was my first classical concert, Belshazzar's Feast. Absolutely blew me away. 
And you were what sort of age then? I was probably about 11 or 12, maybe, something like right. that. Yeah. But, uh, but I absolutely loved it. And um, so I had this strange life of, you know, very ordinary life and uh, with extra ex occasional extraordinary things and always being aware of things that weren't there for other people. Mm. And this went on until I was 15. And uh, on that occasion, I was visiting my dad who lived in Worthing. And um, I'd heard about this fascinating place called Chanctonbury Ring, um, mm. which uh, had a, a Roman temple on the top of it. And I thought I'd really like to find out about that because I was already interested in history. And so I borrowed a bike and I cycled all the way from Worthing to Chanctonbury, which turned out to be quite a long way. Um, and I, as I got there, the night was falling. And, um, but I decided anyway, I've got this far, I'm gonna go on up. Well, as I went up the hill, it got darker and darker. And finally, when I was near the top, it was so dark that I couldn't really see. At this point, I noticed a fire amid the trees because there's a lot of trees on Chanctonbury. I'm sure yeah. you've been up there. Yeah. Um, so I thought, well, I wonder, wonder what's going on, you know, and with all the bravura of a 15 year old curious boy, I went over and I, I came into a circle of trees and there was a fire in the middle and there were people sitting around it. Hmm. And one of them got up, came over towards me and said, we've been expecting you. Uh, and of course, now, if I'd been sensible at this point, I'd have gone, yeah, turned around and run for it. But yeah. I was just curious because mm. it's an extraordinary way to be greeted. Mm. Well, it, to cut a long story short, it turned out that um, these people had been meeting. They were part of a group that had been meeting there. They said since the Middle Ages, mm. uh, same families from the local area and uh, that one of their members had died recently and that they, someone had had a vision to say, a boy will come at this hour at this time on this day and you should welcome him and, and offer him a place in the circle, which Gosh. they've never done before. Yeah. They're absolutely local, local down to the roots, you know. So anyway, they explained all this to me. Then they said, inviting me to sit in the circle, listen and watch. And I did, and I saw them chanting and I saw them doing stuff um, that nowadays would be recognized as elemental magic. Hmm. Um, and, you know, they would be now seen as Wiccan, but they thought Wiccans were recent people who just came along recently and they didn't, you know, they weren't very impressed by them. Was, was it anything like, you're, you're presumably familiar with Wiccan ceremonies, was yeah. it anything like Wiccan? Were they sky clad? Did... Um, occasionally, but not particularly in this instance. Um, hmm. I did ask about that once and they came, my, uh, I, what, what the person you would call the high priestess in a modern uh, society group mm. looked at me and said, with the weather here, are you kidding? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. So yes, they were occasionally in the summer, but in the winter there were robes. Right. Um, yeah. And I mean, a lot of what they did had parallels uh, with modern Wiccan procedures. And I mean, no offense to any, you know, modern Wiccan people who are listening or watching this, but yeah. um, to these people who were, I suppose it would be classified as traditional. Um, mm. This was an, a, a recent, a recent interest among people. They'd noticed there was more uh, interest suddenly, and this must have been the time when Gerald Gardner was getting busy, and you know the, the whole idea was beginning. The Witchcraft Act was repealed, um, and you know there were more people interested in it. So, um, so so give us an idea of the year then, if you were 15, how... how... Uh, that, that would be, hang on, uh, I was born in 48, so uh, 58, um, 63. 63, okay, yeah. 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 So, you know, it was, it was still in the early days. Mm. And I remember them saying, or I remember me saying, what can I read what, to learn? Because I wasn't there, I didn't live in the area, mm. I still lived in London. Hmm. Um, so, you know, they said, well, you know, there's only, there's only one book at the moment to read. And that was Evans Vance's, uh, uh, C Celtic faith. I, I forget the title. Henry Traditions or something. Yes. yes that, it was, it was that one. And it was yes. a standard work. And they said, don't believe every word you read, but at least he came and talked to people. And hmm. apparently he had talked to them. Um, oh, really? yes. so, um, though most of what he did was in Ireland, but he had come over to England as well. Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, that was the title. That's it, that's it. Yeah. yes. Gosh, um, so did you, after that first ceremony, mm. so, I, I, I mean, 
what 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 did they do in that first ceremony? Because you're you're a fifteen year old boy. You've just arrived. So it's an extraordinary scene to stumble upon and and to be welcomed in that way. Can you remember what the sort of ceremony was for? Was it? What I can remember was that they they worked a great deal with the seasons and with the mm. natural world. Obviously, mm. and they, so mostly people from a farming community. Mm. So you know they weren't towners, if you like. They were yeah. very much country folk. So I remember there was a lot of singing and chanting, which was very beautiful, mm. um, you know, and it was singing to, to, to make the year turn, to make the wheel turn. Mm. This would have been, I think, probably around about March, March or April. Right. I'm not sure of the exact timing now, but um, yeah. it was certainly a time when uh, the, you know, the season was changed, was beginning to change. So there wasn't anything more than that. Uh, I mean, I saw much more dramatic things later, but that was the beginning, you know, so that was a kind of easing me in, if you like. Yeah. At the end, they said, we'd like to invite you to join us. And I was fascinated. Mm. I said, you know, I live in London. And they said, no, it's all right. When, when we're going to have a meeting, we'll send you a note mm. and just come if you can. Yeah. So for the next three or four years, every few months, I would get a little note mm. through the post saying, you know, meeting next week. Yeah all terribly weird and hush hush and of course i had to always say to my mom i'm going down to see dad yeah. you know and i'd go and stay with dad in the surgery in the in his surgery because he had another one in, in in worthing yeah um and um and then uh uh you know then i would go off to chanctonbury and and be there for you know most of the most of the nights really uh, how extraordinary how fantastic and so so um what was uh, did you was it a solstice you went to the next one or um i think so um it, it's, it's going back quite a long way now obviously mm. and um some of it's not very clear for me i did write about it um a, a few years ago and again quite recently there was a a conference up in scotland of uh, uh, traditional and various kinds of uh, esoteric lore and uh, as it was no, no longer live it was a virtual one i wrote a piece for it which i think they published online um, I can find the details if you want to have a look. Yeah, well, that's great. We'll give the link if you. Uh, we'll, we'll give the link in addition to the broadcast. That would that would be really fascinating for people. When you said that they became rather dramatic, the ceremonies. Can you give us sort of an idea of? Well, the most dramatic one ever was when um, our leader. Um, I can't tell you her name, hmm. but uh, um, she did a dance in the circle, sky clad. Mm. And she cut herself all over with knives. God. And I saw this, and I saw the blood running down. Mm. And then afterwards, there wasn't a mark. So you know, and I hadn't just had mushrooms or anything else. It was <laughs> I. What I saw was what I saw. Um, so I, mm. that, that was the most dramatic. I mean, most of it was, I guess you'd say, quite low key in the sense that we did things like. Um, there was a woman in the village who had been telling stories about people and um, I was trained how to go out of my body mm. and float along to her house and hover outside her window mm. and influence her to stop doing this. Gosh. No curses or anything, it was just don't do this and yeah. apparently it worked. Right. So, so they didn't teach cursing. No. No. It was very, it was... I, I never felt any really negative energies from them at all i mean mm. you know they were human beings so obviously mm. there were occasional arguments and disagreements and that kind of thing but there were there was a general feeling of a community of friendship and of sharing this unique view of the universe really you know i mean they didn't have goddess names mm. um, they referred to um im upstairs and er downstairs that was, those are the phrases in use. In upstairs and uh, downstairs. So it was like the above and below. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, an im was the god upstairs and er was the goddess downstairs. But they, you know, when I tried to draw in some kind of modern terminology, they always look at me blankly. I remember saying, do I need an athemi? Because yeah. I'd read that you had to have an athemi. Yeah. And my boss turned to me and said, you've got a perfectly good finger, haven't you? You use your finger point it's your intent it's not what you're holding yeah so there yeah. were no there was no kind of stuff like that you know people didn't have wands or athemis or anything like that they didn't wear jewelry or any kind of sign that they were any different to anyone else 
which is maybe how they managed to be, you know, avoid being noticed for such a long time. I don't know. How extraordinary. Did they cast circles? Yeah, well, yes. Um, there was a protective circle made, mm. you know, around the, within the tree group. We always met at the same place. Up on Chanctonbury Ring. Up on Chanctonbury Ring. And we were yeah. very aware of the fact. Um, they weren't speaking, but we knew there was another group on another hill at some distance from there, which I believe was the one um, run by Dorian Valiente. Right. Um, but that was, they felt that was a very different tradition and they didn't speak. That's oh, right. All. Um, but, uh, but there was always the same place. And, you know, after I left eventually, I, I can tell you how and why, if you like, it's quite dramatic again. Yeah, no, do, do. But, then I, but I came, I, what I wanted to say was that I did then visit it again, but maybe 10 or 15 years later. Yeah. And I saw that there was still, there was a, still a firing and it was very obvious that people were still meeting there, hmm. but I didn't see any of the group. And when I went to the local pub to ask if so-and-so was actually around, I just got blank looks. Yeah. The blank looks that you'd give if a, if a photographer or a, a journalist came, you know. Yeah. But, um, but no, I left. Um, I, this is all I've written. I've written about all of this in the, hmm. in the essay that I told you about. Hmm. Um, but basically... It, when I tell this, it still sounds dramatic to me. Mm. But anyway, they had discovered that I had the natural psychic ability. And so they said, we want you to be the focus for a big piece of work. We want to call the guardian of the hill. Mm. Um, and we were, nothing more was explained, just that was what they wanted me to do. Mm. So they put me in the middle of the circle, next to the fire. Everybody else was around in a circle and they were chanting and singing. <coughs> And I was just going out. I literally left my body hmm. um, and floated away up into the air. And at that same time, I saw something coming out of the hill itself. And I'm, I'm, there's no way I can make this sound any less dramatic than it does. But it looked like a huge figure hmm. in made of shadow. There was no face. There was no um, form to it. It was just roughly humanoid. Hmm. Um, and it, it came and loomed over me and said, now, in this, I was the voice I heard in my head, and I just said, no, with as much force as I could. And at that point, I came out of the trance, mm. several people in the circle fell over, fainted. Mm. There was such a blast of power, apparently, from that point. Mm. Uh, you know, and, and basically, a little bit after that, I was politely asked to leave. Really, so when you say that this being said now to you, it, he, she, he, she, or it wanted to take you over, or was that the? I can only assume that, and that's what I felt instinctively, and my instinct was to you say felt no. You had to, to say no to to the. Yeah, yeah. Well, in I mean, when I told this story, I haven't told this story to very many people, but mm. I told it to uh, Olivia uh, Durden Robertson years later. And she said, oh, my dear, they were going to sacrifice you. And I said, I don't really think so. But she said, well, you, were, you did exactly the right thing anyway. <laughs> but um, but it, felt, it felt right at the time. And there was no animosity. It's just that they said, it's not, this is not right. We, we, it's not working, basically. Yeah. And so they asked me if I would leave. And I did. Actually, what, why do you think they wanted to, when they said they were going to call the spirit of the hill, what, what did you think they wanted to do? I think it was something to do with, the, it was, had been a bad harvest mm. that year. And I think it was the time honored thing of you wanting to ask a spirit of power to aid you in that way. Mm. And I, I mean, since then, and with some of the work I've done with RJ Stewart and others, I've learned that, um, you know, there are places like that, that have their own attendant spirits. Mm. And sometimes they were, they were people who were buried there or left there alive to be, to have their spirits basically attached to the place. Mm. Um, and I'm assuming it was something like that. But there mm. was, you know, there was very little explanation, if you know what I mean. We, we didn't talk about things in a theoretical way. We just did them. So I think it's, it's this funny. Week, this week we're going to do this. We're going to uh, silence uh, the gossip in the village or whatever it was. This one, we're going to summon the, the guardian of the hill and you're doing it, basically. <laughs> That's it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, when I, you know, when I was that sort of age, uh, you know, sort of um, 16, 17, 18 and training with Nguyen in, in Druidry. Um, mm. When I look back, I, I think, why didn't I ask questions? Why didn't I? But, exactly. 
people just told you things and you sort of did them. It was, it was, it was, I think when I look at our children, I mean, your, your, your Emerys and you know, our children, um, they're so much more self-possessed nowadays, I think. Oh, and, you know, you know I, I, but, but in, I think when we were young, we, we, we sort of did as we were told and just listened. And, um, but so what, so what happened then when they asked you to leave and you, you know, they, you, you, you left the group, how did your life change then? You were about 18 then, something like that? About that, 18, 19, yeah, thereabouts. Uh, well, basically, I just stopped. I stopped doing anything um, because I still felt quite shaken by the experience. Yeah. This, you know, being, whatever it was. I mean, it was very, very powerful. Yeah. And I still think to this day that if I'd agreed, it would have taken me in somehow. And I don't know what would have happened. Right. But... Um, I said no, and I left, and I left it, and I think at that time I was working in a, a public library, mm. and I started reading the books. This is the thing, they were beginning to, that was the point in time when suddenly there were loads of new books about the, about witchcraft, about the occult, about all of this. So I grabbed all the Golden Dawn stuff, and I grabbed the Druid stuff, and anything else I could find, really, and just read and read and read. Hmm. Uh, this but, is, we're uh, talking about the end of the 60s now. We're talking yeah, about sort of 60s, yeah. 60s. So there's yeah. quite a bit around by this point. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess there was more already, even when I was part of the group, but they were always saying, don't bother to read any of that stuff. Mm. This is the only one they would recommend was the Evans Vents. Um, so, um, but anyway, I was now reading omnivorously and, and picking up as much as I could, but I wasn't doing anything. I tried to... I tried not to, quite consciously, in fact, you know, I would still occasionally see things, um, you know, I remember um, I was, the library I was working in was in Chelsea. And I remember um, coming out of the library entrance one day and looking across the road and I saw a man standing in the middle of the road and a bus came towards him and I had my mouth open to shout, look out, and the bus just drove straight through him and he was still there. Gosh. So it's like, you know, classic exorcist stuff, but I mean, it didn't happen like that too often. But I, yeah. I just remember those things. Um, and I didn't really do very much until um, I was moved to another library and I walked into the staff room one day and I saw this woman who was sitting in the staff room talking about the Mabinogion. Uh -huh. I went over and I sat down and I said, oh, Mabinogion, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm, I've read that, I'm interested in that. And we got chatting. And this turned out to be Kathleen. So, you know, it was, it, and it brought us together. I told her the story. Um, you know, we eventually settled down together and she got me to join a couple of groups that she was a member of at that time. And uh, an amazing old lady called Madge Worthington. I'm sure there's someone out there will remember her. Uh, uh, we were briefly a member of her coven. Oh, right. And that was interesting because, again, for me, that was, oh, the other people do that, but not the same as we were doing it. Yeah. And I was a bit of a nine day wonder because but they were all, the members were always coming to me and saying, did you a lot used to do this or did they have that to say? And I, in the end, I, I mean, this is a bit naughty and I probably really shouldn't say this, but mm. I got impatient with it. Mm. So I said, if you stop asking me questions, I'll give you a chant from Chanctonbury. And I made one up on the spur of the moment. And I Ooh. said, don't tell anyone else, it's top secret. Hmm. Well, about five years after that, I met someone from Australia who said, I could tell you this chart, but it's top secret. Don't pass it on to anyone else. Guess what? It was the one I'd literally plucked out of the air. <laughs> so I know that's a bit naughty. I haven't done that lots of times, if those of you are listening um, or watching. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not conning you. Uh, but it, was just, it was just a moment, a flash of, oh, please stop asking me questions, you know? And, and a bit of research as well, I suppose, because you uh, you discovered what happens, um, you know, when you do that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So it was just interesting that it did pass through. So somewhere in the world there are, um, there are a bunch of people doing, you know, ceremonies using that chant and it was by me. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, so I mean, meeting with Kathleen meant that, uh, you know, she was passionate about all this. She had her own natural psychism too. Um, we moved in together, then we got married. Um, and that's, that's really 
that is to answer your question in the beginning that is really where it begins for me i mean all those other things were preludes but having someone to work with all the time 24 7 living that life living that world and that knowledge and that wisdom and sharing it um was how we got started yes exactly because the the, the two of you together have been you know it's obviously been such a, a, a you created a powerhouse of uh, working together and the, you know the amount of books that you've both been able to produce and obviously sort of firing off each other and 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 did you at, at what point did you I mean when did you get your first book contract how did how did that work had you always wanted to be a writer from a young age uh, fairly yes I had I'd actually always wanted to be a novelist right uh, Oddly enough, I've, although I've written two or three novels, they're all for children. I've never really gone in. It, I started writing a great Arthurian novel, which I think I've told you about before. Mm. And I started it when I was in my early 20s, and mm. I'm still writing it. <laughs> um, you know, and maybe, if spared, it will eventually get finished. Um, yeah. But no, I mean, it was, I, I, I knew I wanted to be a writer. I mean, the first thing I did um, when I was working in the libraries was I, I met a friend called um, Graham Barrisford Young, who's a poet, and we became very good friends. And we found a literary magazine called Labrys together. Oh right. And we did all kind. We did about eight issues. Yeah. And we did specials on Lawrence Durrell and George Seferis, and and we had all kinds of really top writers writing hmm. for it. You know, Kathleen Rain, who was who became a very good friend. Hmm. Who I, I know that you knew too. Hmm. Um, was a very very you know supportive of all that. Um, and so I, I think I always knew that I wanted to write. I mean, I'd written stories when I was a kid. I still remember the first story I ever wrote, which was a haunted house in which a boy goes into the house and the floorboards give way and he falls down into the basement and it's full of skeletons. <laughs> but that's all I can tell you. But <laughs> I know that was my first written uh, attempt to write something. <laughs> and, and what sort of age was that, do you think? Oh, God, probably about eight or nine, maybe. Eight or nine, yes. So was I, it I set up to do it, but the first one, the first one was, uh, I got my first contract in 1979 and the book, which was the Grail, uh, Quest for the Eternal, which was in Thames and Hudson's Art and Imagination series, mm. came out in 1981. And I got that quite by accident because one of my friends at the time was a Sufi scholar named Peter Lamborn Wilson, who mm -hmm. lived in, in um, Chelsea as well. And, um, I can't remember how we came to meet, but we met and probably through Kathleen actually. Hmm. And we became quite good friends. We were, we used to go for walks. We used to talk a lot. And he was doing a book on angels, a fabulous hmm. book on angels for Thames and Hudson. And he heard that they were looking for more writers to do more numbers for the art and imagination series. And he said, well, there's only one person you should go to and that's John Matthews because he knows everything there is to know about the grail. Mm. So I put in my, my three page proposal and heard back in a week and they said, yes. Um, and they offered me a, an advance of 800 pounds, which in those days was quite a lot. Yeah. So I went, okay. Yeah. Um, and I wrote the book, I think in less than a year. Yeah. Um, and I remember, I still remember going into Thames and Hudson. Those were the days when, you know, you went in with your manuscript and handed it to your editor and they sat down and looked at it while you were in the room. Terrifying. Yes. yes. I'm sure you may remember this happening maybe to you, but um, and I, I can't now remember the name of my editor. I thought it was someone else, but he tells me it wasn't him. But anyway, he sat me down and he went, right, right. Yeah, very good. Now go away and rewrite it. Oh, no. And I went, what's wrong with it? And he said, go away and rewrite it wouldn't tell me anything else. So I went home, sat down, read it again. I thought, it seems all right to me. Mm. And I left it a couple of days and then I read it again. And suddenly I began to realize that there were bits that I'd missed out. There were things that I hadn't joined up, if you like. They weren't coherent. Mm. Because after all, it was the first book I'd ever written. Yeah. And yeah. so I just basically, I just binned the manuscript, which I now would never dare to do, but I did at the time. And I yeah. just wrote it all out again from the beginning took it back in and he again sat me down in the chair looking through the page he says okay isn't that interesting because i suppose have you ever read a have you ever read a book on how to write a book um i once looked at stephen king's book because <laughs> i was curious because i 
it was I thought it was brilliant. I thought all his information was absolutely extraordinary, but I'd already been doing that from the start. I, I know. I remember after about ten years of writing books thinking, I wonder I, I wonder if there are any rules to this. I wonder I wonder if I <laughs> and I remember reading a book on how to write a book. I can't remember what it was, you know, and picking up a few ideas, but but you know, and 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 thinking, oh God, why didn't I realise that? You know. Um but so let me, was it when you were editing Labyrinths that you came across, um, oh gosh, um, J.P. Travers, is that, you know, who wrote? Um, oh, P.J. Travers. P.J. P. J. Travers. P.L. Travers. P.L. Travers, yeah. Dobbins, yes. Yeah. Um, no, I didn't come across her that way. I came across her through Kathleen. Yeah. Right? Because we used to visit Kathleen quite often. She was only 15 minutes away from us. And she often you invited- Travers. You used to visit Travers. No, Kathleen Rain. Oh, Kathleen Rain. Okay, sorry. Yeah, we used to we used to visit her. She lived in Portland Square. We yeah. were only a few few really half a mile away, um, and so we often visited both of us. And in fact, she became a kind of honorary godmother to Emrys when our son was born. She had a little party for him, and she made a cake with stone with a stone circle and icing on the top. Oh, how fantastic! I have pictures of it. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, but no, she said, "Oh, there's someone you really must meet." Because in the next square up, and I forget which one it was now, but it's the next square up along on, on King's Road, um, you must meet, and it's P.L. Travers. Hmm. So we went along, and we had the most bizarre evening, uh, because P.L. Travers is, was very eccentric, as you probably know. Hmm. Um, and she, I can't now remember where the conversations went, but almost every time we made an opinion about anything she would say oh no no that's absolutely not right no and then she'd give us her version you know and I think the I'm not sure whether the movie had come out at that point but of course it's very famous the story they made a film about it um that she really hated the whole thing and hated the music and all that all that sort of stuff but but I remember that we talked mostly about mythology and folklore rather than about Mary Poppins. Because right. she knew an immense amount. You know, she wrote a book called What the Bee Knows. Yes. I don't yes. know if you ever read that one. It's um, No, I know the quote, Ask the Wild Bee What the Druid Knows. Right. Oh, well, okay. she event ad adapted it to be What the Bee Knows. Right. And it was really a selection of essays about folklore and myth and it's it's one of my favorite books i read it every now and then because she was so perceptive and so understanding yes so, so yeah we had that that was a strange a strange encounter as they say but fascinating yes absolutely how fantastic and and um when you so the first book that you were um that you got the commission for was a book about, you know, a subject that has become a passion for you and you've written lots about. Why, why is the Grail so important to you? Oh, that's quite a hard one to answer. Um, I mean, I had been interested in it for quite a while before I wrote the book. That was why Peter Lamborn Wilson said, you know, that they should go to me for that book because I knew more about it than anyone else he knew. And you were what? Can I just ask you, just so I can sort of place it? You're you're still working at the library. Yeah. And you're what sort of age? Um, I'm about in my in my late thirties, I think. Late thirties. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, yes. And I'd been I'd written. I mean, apart from editing Labris, I'd written a few essays, a few articles published here and there, some poetry, uh, but not really anything else. Uh, hmm. My my friend Graham, whom I founded the uh, founded the lab, the labyrinth labyrinth with, um, moved down to Froome, and he became the mayor of Froome, mm -hmm. and opened a bookshop, mm -hmm. and ran a small publishing company down there called Brands Head. All right. And uh, he he and I did a few things together. He published my actually I suppose it was just before the Grail book, so I'm thinking non commercial then. But he did mm -hmm. a collection of poetry called Merlin in Caledon that I wrote hmm. um, and that's still I still have some copies um, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, that so I suppose that was really my first book that must have been around about 1979 or 80 mm -hmm. um, so yes I'm still at the library um, uh, married to Catelyn by this time um, and working together in all kinds of different ways and um, meeting interesting people mm -hmm. How fantastic. But so, and, and 
Which came first, your fascination for the Grail or for the Arthurian mystery? Um, oh, Arthurian first. Um, I can tell you exactly when that happened. That was when I read T.H. White's Once and Future King. Until that moment, I'd been writing a book about Vikings. Oh, really? That was what I thought was the, the most exciting thing I could, I could write about at that mm. time. Yeah. When I read, I finished uh, Once and Future King, mm. um, I literally, not in a bad way, in excitement, threw the book across the room, jumped <laughs> up and shouted upstairs to Catelyn, I've just discovered what I want to write about. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And actually, I'm not sure Catelyn was there, but anyway, maybe it was my, another friend. But I knew mm. that in that moment, I decided that was my subject. So I started, um, I went to Kensington Library, where mm -hmm. I later worked, and mm -hmm. I found um, that they had a folklore collection, uh, which was reserved, but you could get access to. And suddenly I was in this huge room with hundreds of books on folklore and mythology. And it mm -hmm. felt like paradise. And then I went to look for Arthur and I found there were two bays of books just on that subject. And I remember I took, you're allowed six books, and I took the six biggest and heaviest I could find, brought them home, read them, devoured them, made lists from the bibliographies in the back of things I wanted to read again, went back, picked up another six and so on. And I read every, pretty much everything on those two bays in the next two years, two or three years. Yeah, it was just that, you know, I mean, I was reading other stuff, but it was that that, that obsessed and fascinated me. Mm. And at some point, well, at some point I decided I wanted to write this great novel and I started working on that. And at some point then, around about that time, I found that the grail was the key to everything else. If you didn't have the Grail story in Arthur, you just had a Dark Age warrior who got the people together, saved the country, blah, blah. But there were some magic bits in and it was the magic bits that interested me. I will say that I've always been more interested in the, the myth of Arthur than I have in the history of Arthur, although that fascinates me too. Hmm. Um, but it was the grail that I felt was the key because the grail is present and it also breaks the round table because it's all the knights going in quest of the round table and only very few of them, three of them finding it and all the others either dying or disappearing that gives, that, that reduces the round table to a few of the famous ones like Gawain and Lancelot and has, allows the enemies like Mordred to come in and take over and destroy it and mm. end Arthur's reign. So without the grail, that wouldn't have happened, I think, mm. or it would have happened differently perhaps, but, that was the starting point. And then I started looking at what is the grail. Now, obviously the first thing you see when you start looking for the grail is the Christian symbolism. It's the Eucharist. It's the cup of the last supper. It's the Holy grail. Hmm. But I'd already read enough um, Celtic material at that point to, to understand that that was simply a later um, aspect of it. It, be, it went back much further than that. Since then, in more recent years, I've discovered it goes even further back than Celtic. Um, in fact, into early Hebrew tradition, mm. uh, which is something I'd kind of seen but dismissed as being not so relevant. You know, I was obviously very deeply enmeshed in Celtic lore and legend by then. And do you see some, is there some link between the early Celtic uh, use of it in, in, in the old stories and so on? Uh, and the cauldrons that we find, and 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 Middle Eastern or Hebrew mythology, or yes, um, well, I mean, the 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 thing that I was most interested in at that at the beginning was the Celtic cauldrons because mm. you had the cauldron of Anu and the cauldron of rebirth. You had all these different things, and they mm. obviously performed the same function. Mm. The Grail, whatever you mean by God or goddess, mm. whatever you mean by deity, the Grail is a hotline. Mm. All the versions of the Grail that I've read are about that, one mm. way or the other. Um, so first of all, I saw the Holy Grail as a hotline to the Christian God. Mm. Then I saw, discovered that the cauldrons were hotlines to Anun, to various other places in the Celtic uh, cosmos, and to other beings. Um, and then it's only really in the last 10 years that I've, I, I was uh, inter became interested in the whole idea of Joseph of Arimathea, tracing that back to the temples of the Grail. The book I wrote recently is the first of a two-part 
study about the temples of the grail and when i started to study it oddly enough it took me back full circle to peter lamborn wilson because mm. peter had given me an essay to read by an american scholar called arthur upham pope and pope had found an old manuscript that virtually no one had looked at on the grail which described the temple where it was held mm. and there were two things about this first of all he noticed the very close resemblance to the Temple of Solomon in description, hmm. <clears throat> excuse me. And the second thing he noticed was that there was an actual site in what is now Azerbaijan right. um, that resembled the description in the poem hmm. almost exactly. So he, he was an Orientalist. He was very highly respected, um, helped to found uh, various groups in this country and in America that study um, you know, uh, the, the magic and the esotericism and the traditions of everything from Zoroaster to the more recent um, things. And um, he, he organized a, a, an exhibition, expedition hmm. and he went out to the site and he took photos of it and he measured it and he found that the detail was incredibly accurate. Hmm. This poem had somehow in the 12th, 12th stroke, 13th century, we're not sure of the exact date, had somehow seen, the author had seen the place, perhaps even visited it. Because one of the things you notice in the poem, uh, most medieval poems are told in the second person. Mm. But suddenly, when you get to the description, he says, and I saw this, and I felt this, and I experienced this. And I think that means that either the poet writing it, um, whose name is usually given as Albrecht von Schaffenberg, but that's probably a, a pseudonym, hmm. uh, had actually either been there or talked to someone who had been there because suddenly it leaps into focus. Hmm. So looking at all this side of the history led me to look again at the whole Solomonic mysteries. Um, and I found that there were an immense number of parallels. And I found that the poem that most people think was the first poem about the Grail, which is the Conte du Graal by Chrétien de Troyes, hmm. it actually describes the Temple of Solomon, the Holy of Holies, and there's the grail inside it with the wounded king and all of the other characters that appear in that. Mm. So that, in a kind of way, brought me back full circle, as I said, to looking at the grail from the beginning. Um, and this is, at the moment, the earliest form of it that I've been able to find, is what is found in the Holy of Holies. And, of course, it is, once again, a hotline to God. Yes. So there are, there are elements in the Holy of Holies, uh, obviously the Ark of the Covenant, but within the Ark itself are things like the Rod of Aaron, uh, a cup a, and a stone, a stone tablet, um, yeah. all of which exactly correspond to the four hallows in the Grail legend. So th lots of things like that. How, how, how extraordinary. Now, I, I have in my hand... Mm. Uh, the Grail Tarot. Your publisher sent me this wonderful. Does some of this come into into the Grail Tarot? Um, a little bit, not so much of the, the the newer things because this originally was done a little while ago. Yeah, it's actually a reissue. Right. But um, no, I mean, what the what the Grail Tarot does is to look at the Templar aspect of it. Um, because the Templars were, were, were very much connected to the, to, the, to the Middle East, weren't they? They were very much so. And one of the most interesting things that I found, I mean, I don't know how much of you have read on this, um, and some of the listeners I know will probably have read loads of things like Dan Brown and the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail and all of that. Uh, <laughs> and one of the things that comes up again and again is that the Templars, when they made their base in Jerusalem, um, went into the basement that had been part of the original temple looking for a treasure. Now, there's huge amounts of argument as to why they were doing this and whether they found anything. Mm. That's another issue altogether. The point is that they described this place that they went to as the Stables of Solomon. Ah. Now, when I was researching the Temples of the Grail book, mm. right at the end, so I didn't have time much to put much about it into the book, um, I discovered that there was another site within a mile of the one that I thought was the Grail Temple, and it was called the Stable of Solomon. So Sorry. I think actually that the Templars went there and were looking for something there, um, whatever it was. 
how how e extraordinary and 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 I mean I can see from 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 these the, the the beautiful artwork in in these in these cards. This is this deck is evoking this. Uh, how can we describe it? Archetype or or, or atmosphere of 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 both the Middle East and and you know the the the, the Holy Land and yeah. the Grail the, and the mysteries of the Grail in the, in the most sort of powerful. Oh, you see oh. of Solomon. I mean, I put in quite, and I think some yes, of it's it's unconscious. Yeah. Yes. So even in. even though you even though you were working on this before you got onto all of all of this stuff, the the, the seeds of it were there, weren't they? Yeah, um, yeah. And yes, now this is so. Is the the, the temples of the Grail, um, the temples of the Grail book that's come out? Has it? That's out from Llewellyn. From um, Llewellyn. And, and did you say it was one of a series of two? Well, I'm doing another one um, at right. the moment, um, which is part two, because um, one of the things that really most excited me, I don't want to give away too much, but yeah. um, one of the things that I discovered, uh, the, the poem, by the way, that I referred to, which refer, which describes the temple, is yeah. called Ticherel. And it's, it's called what, sorry? Ticherel. Ticherel, yeah. yeah. And who is the original Grail King. He's the mm. old Grail King. Um, he all kinds of all kinds of miraculous things happen that enable him to build the temple. Mm. Um, but the this poem, Ticherel, is a very very long poem. It's something like sixty thousand lines, and it's never been done into modern German. And the third part had never even been edited from the manuscript. Good heavens! But the guy who was doing it in the nineteenth century died before he could finish it. <laughs> no one took it on. And yeah. somebody ages ago, back at the in the forties, I think, read what he had done and said, this is the most boring medieval manuscript I've ever seen. Don't bother reading it. And ever since then, it's been ignored. Right. Entirely. One or two people have picked up on e it. Even by Himmler, Himmler's Annenerbe. Even by Annenerbe. I suspect that um, uh, the guy who they were employing, Otto Rahn, yeah. um, may have known about it because he seems to have read everything. Hmm. But what was so interesting about this was that um, in the esoteric groups that I belonged to over the years, particularly the one run by Gareth Knight, mm. um, I used to be hear, told the same thing, that Prester John, that yeah. is the priest king from the, the far east behind the east, yeah. was the guardian of the grail for our time. And I'd always assumed that this was an idea that had been brought up by A.E. Waite, or one right. of the Gone Dawn people. And I thought, well, there you are. Charles Williams wrote a novel called War in Heaven, about the grail and Prester John appears as a young man in a charcoal gray suit who has magic and power. And I loved all of that. And I've been fascinated by the Prester John story and had thought about writing a book about it. Mm. Then when I was doing this research into Ticherel, um, I found someone who could, who had made a summary of the third and final part of the, of the text. So it wasn't a translation, but mm. it was a detailed summary. And in that, guess what happens? Um, the people who built the, te the Temple of the Grail, they start, start worrying about um, what's going to happen to it. You know, will someone come and steal it? So they make a copy and they send the copy to Accra, which is interesting because that has its own story about a mythical cup or a mm. semi-mythical cup. But the other one, they say, we have to take this to the Far East and beyond. So they mm. set off on a journey and they encounter Prester John. <laughs> and they say to him, "Will sir, will you take a, will you take on the guardianship of this cup?" And he says, oh, "Tell me the story." So they tell him the story, and he goes, "All right, then I'll take it." <laughs> so there is actually a medieval source for this idea that Prester John is perhaps still somewhere um, the guardian of the grail. Guardian of the grail. So the second book um, is all about that and a few other things that I won't talk about here, but um, that I'm working on along with several other things, um, hopefully will come out in the next year or two. Great, oh, we'll, we'll look forward to that. But the thing I would like to say, by the way, about the Grail Tarot, yes. is that it is designed a rather unique thing. I don't think anyone else has ever done this. Um, mm. If you lay all the cards side by side, they have yeah. no borders. And if you lay them side by side, beginning with the Fool and then all the four suits together, they tell the story of the Grail. Oh, how fantastic. So you can use it in more than one way. You can use it as a standard tarot, 
yes. um, where you can work with the grail magic. And a lot of in the book, you'll find, um, you'll find stuff about how to work with it in that way, that it actually tells you the story. And each of the suits is about a young novice, no, no, novice hmm. um, in the order who wants to find the grail. So each suit is a little separate journey and the ma major is a big journey and the whole deck is the great journey. Oh, how wonderful. I, th I think it's marvellous when, you know, to use the tarot for, for more than simply its oracular use, but, but also as a, as, a, as a teaching device as well. As a, Absolutely, yeah. Because, because you, because, so that's, that's available through Schiffer, isn't it? That's published by Schiffer. It is, and um, um, I understand that copies are in the warehouse here, so it is distributed here. And and then and then and then I've just received this the Byzantine tarot, which oh, yes. looks absolutely extraordinary, and I haven't even. Gosh, opened... How restrained of you! How restrained! I, I know I, I've restrained myself specifically <laughs> for this this event, so I'm ripping it open now. Fantastic. And again, it's the the production values, as they say, are just wonderful. Yeah. So it's illustrated by Scylla. That the the Grail tarot was illustrated by Giovanni Caselli, yes. who I met at your birthday party, didn't I? Uh, no, this is another one. I've actually oh. never met Giovanni. You met oh, right. uh, you met Andrea Aste at my birthday. Ah, okay, but okay. No yeah. Italian, but no, actually, uh, because um, Giovanni doesn't speak English, and I, yeah. my Italian is not good enough for the kind of conversation we had, yeah. I would give descriptions of stuff, be sent off to him, and his wife would translate them for him. <laughs> so, but I never actually got to meet him. Oh, you never met him? Oh, right. Work, because all the work, every single picture in the Grail Tower is based on uh, on traditional work from the Middle Ages. Yes, yes. We drew and photoshopped and, you know, collaged. Um, so, you know, when you're looking through them, if you know about some um, medieval art, you'll go, oh, look, that's from so and so and so on. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yes, no, it, had, yeah. yes, it really yeah, resonated. Yeah, I couldn't tell you which ones those are, but, you know, yeah. he knew, obviously. So, th this one, too, the Byzantine Tarot with yes. illustrations by Scylla Conway. This looks absolutely superb as well, and this has come out. And how different is this one? Well, this is a this is more of a standard tarot. I yeah. mean, again, I'll tell you the story of how it originated because um, Silda and I met at a a launch for one of my other books at Sam Watkins shop in London. Right. And we got chatting, and she said. Oh, no, I said, I've always wanted to do a Byzantine tarot. And she looked at me and she said, but I've always wanted to do a Byzantine tarot. <laughs> so we looked at each other and said, well, should we just do it then? Yes. So that oh, was wonderful, because she's done her intuitive tarot, hasn't she? She has, and she has a new one coming out called The Ancient Gods, which is absolutely amazing. And most of them she does herself, yes. Yes, yes, they and are. The, the artwork is... She went, she went out to Greece and to the Middle East and painted those in the places where they were actually, you know, the actual icons, and they're all based on actual icons from the Byzantine tradition. So well, she they sort of they the glow, color. and and even you know, even on the computer screen, you can you can see them glowing, can't you? Um, how fantastic! Um, but this, the outline of it is more or less follows the the kind of standard, um, you know, uh, right away. Or occasionally, I use the the Marseille. For, for a lot of my things, I tend to mix the two. Um, but um, of course, at the time, there was no concept of the tarot during the time of the Byzantine Empire. Yes. So, what? but, the, but a very interesting thing did happen. Um, you had a big outburst of people known as iconoclasts who said that you could not paint pictures of God or Jesus or any of the disciples. You could only use abstract. Right. And one of the empresses, um, I think it's Helena the second, I'm not quite sure, I may be wrong on that one, um, said, uh, no, no, it's fine. You can do it. I give you permission as the empress of Byzantium. Go ahead. And the point is, if she hadn't done that, we probably wouldn't have the tarot. Because, um, you know, there would have been no, the iconography would have been, would continue to be, as it still is in the Middle East, parts of the Middle East. Uh, no uh, representations of the uh, human form. Uh, yeah. So I think, so we thought um, very much that uh, within, within the scope of the tarot itself, um, it, was, it was good to celebrate the fact that we might not have a tarot if we hadn't had a Byzantine empress who said this. 
Yes. So then, of course, I started researching, and so had already done some research herself too. Um, and we found that the archetypes of the tarot were all present. They were all there. Within um, Byzantine art? Within Byzantine art, yes. There wasn't yeah. any concept. There wasn't a set of cards. There were no yeah. uh, specific meanings in that way. But what I'm saying is that it was very easy to uh, apply the tarot archetypal forms and meanings to images that already existed. So, mm. for instance, there's one in there for the lightning struck tower, uh, which actually does show a lightning struck tower, which is an image that existed. Yes, yes, exactly. In the deck there, you'll find it. Uh, yeah. And I mean, again, we, we looked at the, the organization of the Byzantine world and it's the courts particularly it had a very complex court. To this day, p people still say that, you know, if a place or a person is Byzantine, they're saying very complex and a bit crooked. <laughs> um, but in the, at the time, it was all kind of backstabbing and trying to get to the top of the ladder and all of that. Very familiar stuff. Yes. Um, and so we were able to adapt, you know, the swords and the cups and the rest of it, um, you know, to make it fit together very well, we felt. And as I said, Scylla's work, absolutely extraordinary. The fact that she went to the trouble of going out there and, copy, you know, painting them in the spot and more sketching and then painting them back when she got home and so on. Yes, ab 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 absolutely beautiful. Absolutely lovely. And that's by Schiffer as well, isn't it? And then you were telling me when we when yeah. we had a phone call the other day, you were telling me about your your latest project, which sounds extraordinary. Really? Well, here it is. Um, my turn to hold things up. It's the Tarot of Light and Shadow. Yeah. And this is one that I have done with Andrea uh, Aste, whom you met, and who's a mm. fantastic Italian artist. He did something called the Book of Shadows Tarot, which was very successful. And he first met Kathleen when she was on a tour in, in Italy. They really got to like each other. He was fascinated by my work. And so when he moved to Britain, we got together and we've become very, very good friends. Great. And in, over the years, we talked a lot about the differences in tarot and the similarities in tarot. And we began to hear a lot about people who would take a standard deck and they do a reading. And then they'd pick up another deck and they'd take two or three cards out of that and lay them next to or under or over or across the reading they'd already had and use, it, use that to moderate it in some way. Mm. So we thought, well, this is a very interesting idea, but suppose you had intentionally two decks mm. that were intended to be used like that, that you could use one for one aspect and another from another aspect. So what we ended up with is, is the Tower of Light and Shadow. And you'll see, if I hold the box up, <clears throat> that we have two decks inside. Two complete decks in there. Decks, 78 cards each one. Yeah. Uh, one is the, one is the, the, the shadow deck hmm. and the other is the light deck. And of course, we immediately ran into all sorts of problems with people saying, oh, you mean the shadow work as in Jungian psychology, hmm. uh, which you're very familiar, or, or the light deck is good and the dark deck is bad. And we were going, no, no, it's nothing to do with that at all. We actually wanted to call it the, the tarot of dawn and Twilight. Mm. The publishers didn't want to do that. They thought that would be too obscure. So yes. we ended up with Light and Shadow. So I spent a lot of time over the last few weeks explaining to people, um, you know, that we don't mean, shadow doesn't mean negative, light doesn't mean good. Mm. Uh, what they are are two different ways of looking at the same question. Mm. And you can use them separately, or you can interleave the whole lot, which is a massive bundle, I can tell you. Yeah. Most, even my hands can't cope with it. Um, and you get very interesting comparisons because when, when Andrea worked on this, um, he made subtle changes in each one. So here's a very good example. This is the hanged man. And you'll see there's the hanged man in the shadow. And Bring the it closer. In the light. Bring it and closer. When you, is that ah, good? Yes. yes. You put them together side by side like that. You'll see there is a big tree in the middle. Yes. Yes. Which those two halves form. Then... If you turn it round, this way, you have a forest. Oh, yes. So a lot of things like this. And if you look really carefully at the cards, I don't know how, how, whether you can see all this, but there are a lot of little subtle differences. Mm. Like instead of butterflies, as we have in the light one, we have bees in the, um, in the dark, and we have some bats. Mm. And so all the way through, all the way through both decks, um, we have 
uh, you know, we have these little differences. These differences. Well, of course, it's like, you know, that if you, if you do, you know, the way the light falls differently at dusk and uh, dawn Absolutely. and different shadows, the shadows lie in a different way and, and things are revealed in one kind of light that are hidden in another kind of light. You've so I really to... like that. And I think, I think taking different perspectives on issues is, um, is really powerful. So that's, that's, that's fantastic. Because they're, because they're intended to be used together as well, you don't get a contradiction. It's like you don't get one answer from light and another answer from shadow. You get one that interleaves itself. Do you have reversed meanings as well? Um, we didn't put any in the book because it just starts to get really complicated. That would, that would start it to get work. complicated. It would yeah. work that way, I think. What we do have, we put in two extra cards. Um, in, in a lot of the earlier tarots, you have something called cartes blanches, white mm. cards. Mm. And these were put in there to originally to indicate a uh, significator, to indicate you. Mm. Um, we did these ones and we made them cosmic mirrors. Oh, yes. So there's one for each deck. And I should have explained, by the way, that the backs of the cards are exactly the same. Right. If you lay them face down, you can't tell whether you've got light or dark. Right. But what we use these, these cosmic mirrors for is you shuffle them into the deck and then you look at the cards that lie on either side of where they come and that right. helps you to choose your, your cards. And of course, if by any chance, which does sometimes happen, you get the same card from both decks, that's very powerful in itself. Yes. Because when you read the meanings in the, in the little book, um, which goes with it, here's the, the booklet that goes along with it. Hmm. Um, you get basically, you get... Um, oh, sorry, go away. <laughs> sorry, that's right. I'll cut the sound off. I'll start that bit again. <laughs> yes. When you look in the little book, you you'll see that you've got a light reading and a shadow reading for each card. Yes. Uh, next to each other, so you can see then immediately how the, the differences are mm. uh, and the similarities. And mm. it's very interesting because as soon as you start thinking about how does one differ from the other? Um, how does one way of looking at something differ from the other? What is it about the magic of twilight that makes it look both perhaps for some people more sinister, perhaps for others more magical um, than, the, than the, the, day, the light of the day, the very beginning of the day. Uh, and it's amazing how much, again, when you apply this to more or less traditional tarot meanings, um, it really it really qualify they qualify each other mm, mm. So yes. that, that, this, is the first, this is the first intentional uh double deck that we know of we know some other tarot people who's kind of done one deck deck and then gone well maybe i could visit that place again but they've mm. never done it sort of with never gone into it with that idea of doing you know the, the looking two ways of looking at the same question yes I, I, I have, and that's has that been published already Yes, that's out now and available from Watkins Media. Right. Um, and you find it, as they say, in all book bookstores and on those um, big uh, sprawling companies that we don't name. Yes. And various yes. other places. So, you yes. know, um, and, right. and indeed from us at um, our website. We also Which is HelloQuest, isn't it? HelloQuest.org.uk. Yes. Um, and that has all of it. We have copies of all of these at the moment anyway. Because uh, I believe, amazingly, that the Byzantine tower is already sold out. Um, they, the first delivery in this country, not yes. sold out in the world, but in this country, it mm -hmm. I think sold out almost immediately. So, fantastic. which is wonderful. So, and we're getting fantastic reviews for the light and shadow. Somebody even wrote that this would change the way that tarot was read forever. I, yeah, well, well, <laughs> that 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 is fantastic. And I came across the idea. I think you've, you're really onto something here. I felt first came across the idea of using two decks was when um, a, a, a friend of ours and colleague in, um, who runs a psychotherapy training institute told me that they were using our Druid Animal Oracle mm. um, in two decks and they were in workshops and they would put two decks, one on either side of the room, and then they would get participants to choose one with their left hand to represent something something coming from their unconscious that for them to look at and one with their right hand or their dominant hand rather 
uh, to choose something that's in their consciousness at the moment and, and then to put them together. And I thought this was an interesting idea. So I, try, I was doing a workshop in Germany and we, um, we tried this and it really was having two decks, two of the same decks, you yeah. know, so I can see how working with two decks really can. You had two add, whole decks. Two whole decks. Fantastic. And then you took a card from a, and, and, and it, it, some movement was built in if, with a group, you know, walking to one side and it was decorated in a different way and then walking to the other side. So it was turned into a kind of ritual as well. Um, and then, then everybody shared, you know, and so on. Um, so I mean, but, similar in some ways. Yeah. The yeah. Only, the only thing we've got differently is the, the, the details. Yeah, yeah, you've got these uh, changing uh, they're, they're quite subtle. I mean, some of them are subtle. And you know, the, one of the other things that I do a lot um, is, is read cards like a story, you know, as yes. I mentioned with the Grail Tarot. But if, I'm, if I have a reading, I'll often lay out five or six cards in a row. And then I look at which way the cards are facing. Yes. Nowadays, the tendency is they look straight out at you. But in yes. the earlier traditions, they look from left or right. right. And yes. so in this deck, for instance, if you've got two of the court cards, uh, one of the kings, I can't remember which one now, is, is going that way mm. in the shadow deck and that way in the light deck. And yes. so they're going away from each other. And that's significant. But if yes. you and then of course, it, out, depending on what they're looking at. They're looking at each other. Yes. So, yes. you know, um, so th this is something that really fascinates me too. And it's another development in this. Yes. Uh, we've, we've hardly started yet. You know, we've got, there are more applications, I suspect, than we've realized. Well, I think this, John, is, is the, the secret of eternal youth, which, of course, was uh, perhaps one of the, 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 the goals of, of drinking from the Holy Grail, is to, is, to, and, and, and is to have exciting projects that one can work on so that even as one moves into one's maturity, one is still infused and excited by new ideas. And I can, oh, I can see this working with you. And, and I think... The test of a good conversation is when you realize it could go on forever because there's so much to talk about. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, it helps having a really good uh, interviewer who knows what to ask. Well, well, thank you, John. It's been a fantastic pleasure. We'll have to do it again. And, yeah, and, and Not in but, another 30 years, please. I might yes. not be around then. <laughs> That'll be great. Well, thank you so much, John. It's been great listening to you. Thank you for having me. And it's been great talking, Philip. You take care. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>